Hijack by Robert L. Fish Five o'clock on a late Sunday afternoon, a warm, hazy day with only a faint cloud line at the distant horizon, hovering over the low Tennessee mountains, sloping toward flatness to the west, and the plane, a 727 trijet, at 28,000 feet, approaching the Tennessee River Valley on a south-southwest heading from Kennedy in New York to New Orleans, with the sun quartering in on the cockpit, sinking fast. The radio man pushed himself into the cockpit through the narrow door from the cabin. Adjusting his trousers, nodding comfortably to the captain, he settled himself at his desk again, putting his earphones back in place, reaching to fiddle with knobs. The captain studied him a moment, reading nothing in the even expression, and then glanced over his shoulder, looking below. Sunlight winked from water. The captain reached for his microphone, switching off the soft cabin music to gain priority, pressing the button that transferred the intercom system from tape to voice. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. To the right of the plane, almost directly beneath us, is the Watts Bar Lake, a part of the TVA project. Those passengers on the left can see the Watts Bar Dam and Lake Chickamauga beyond. In the distance to the east, for those with sharp eyesights, there are the Great Smoky Mountains. He replaced the microphone neatly and flipped the switch. The music returned. Almost in the same instant, a light flashed on his intercom panel. The captain leaned over and pressed a button. Yes? Captain, this is Clarice. We've got trouble. Trouble? A passenger is locked in the washroom with Millie. The stewardess's voice hurried on, anxious to avoid misunderstanding. It isn't a pass, Captain. It's a hijacking. Her voice, striving for steadiness, echoed metallically in the crowded cockpit. The radio man stared. The co-pilot started to come to his feet. Captain Littlejohn's restraining hand motioned him to sit down again. Where are the air marshals? One of them is here with me now. Before you put him on, what about the passengers? They don't know a thing yet. Good, let's keep it that way. Now let me talk to the marshal. There was a brief pause, and then a man's low voice was heard in the cockpit. Hello, Captain. Apparently what happened was the man walked back to the lavatory, nobody paying any attention to him, and when he got there, he pulled a gun on the girl and forced her into the washroom. I've spoken to her through the door. So far she's all right, but she says he's got a gun and a knife, and also a bottle he claims is nitro. She says it looks oily and yellow. The sky marshal cleared his throat. What do you want us to do? Nothing, the captain said quickly and firmly. Go back to your seat. He's having Millie talk because he has her between him and the door. Go sit down. Let Clarice handle any communication. I'll get through to New Orleans for instruction. The radio man was already at work, calling the New Orleans Tower. The captain's face was stiff. He spoke into the microphone. Clarice? Yes, Captain. Put an out-of-order sign on the washroom door and keep the curtain drawn. Is Millie still all right? Yes, sir. Wait a second. She's saying something. There was a pause. Hello, Captain. She says he wants the plane diverted to Jacksonville to refuel. Where does he want to go? We have more than enough fuel for Cuba. Better have Millie remind him this isn't a 747, however. Yes, sir. She didn't say anything else. Who is he? Do you know? He's on the seat chart as Charles Wagner from Hartford. He was in seat 16C on the aisle. I served him lunch when we left Kennedy. What did he look like? Clarice sounded unsure of herself. Like, like anybody, I guess. Mid-thirties. Hair a little long, but getting thin. How much did he have to drink? Just a beer. I'm sure he wasn't drunk. What should I do? Nothing. Try to look busy back there in case anybody wonders why, why you're hanging around there. Get that sign up right away and remember the curtain and let me know if... The radio man swung around. New Orleans Tower, I've already identified. Mayday here, the captain said into the microphone. We've got a hijacker on board. What condition? He has one of our stewardesses locked in the washroom, armed several times, maybe with nitroglycerin too, it sounds like it. Where does he want to go? So far, just to JAX for refueling, he says. Hold it, said the voice. I'll contact higher up and be back. The captain stared ahead, his face a mask. Under his hand, the wheel held steady. The shadows ahead deepened. The wait seemed endless, filled with a niggling static. Then the static cleared. A different voice was on the radio. It sounded more assured, more authoritative. Captain Littlejohn, this is security, New Orleans. Permission granted to change course to Jacksonville. The captain was already digging into his map bag for routing maps. Captain Littlejohn's hand was already swinging the wheel, banking gently. A thought came to him to explain away any of his passengers' doubts. Ladies and gentlemen, he said on the cabin intercom, to give the people on the other side of the plane a chance to see what little can be seen of the TVA project at this late hour, 
He continued our wide banking circle, coming out of it gently with the noise pointing now to the southeast in the growing darkness there. The voice of security came on. Good work, Captain. Eventually, of course, they're going to have to know. In the meantime, tie into Jacksonville security. If they've been informed, we'll be on too. Roger, Captain Littlejohn said, and he peered over the co-pilot's chart soldier at the air map. Clarice's voice came back. Captain? The captain straightened up from the folded map almost reluctantly. Yes? He wants money, a ransom for the passengers and the plane. He wants it waiting for him when we get there, otherwise he says he'll take Millie first and then blow up the plane. How much ransom? Clarice swallowed. Uh, a quarter of a million dollars. Captain Littlejohn's expression didn't change in the least. He picked up his microphone. New Orleans Security, do you still read me? A different voice answered. This is JAX. We read you loud and clear. The hijacker wants a quarter of a million dollars. We heard. Who is he? He's listed as Charles Wagner from Hartford, Connecticut. What else does he want? One second. The microphone was laid aside temporarily and the intercom button pressed. Clarice, anything else? Yes, sir. A whole flock of things. I guess he's had time to think. I scribbled them down. Clarice referred to her paper. Her tone changed abruptly. I'm sorry, sir. That lavatory is out of order. No, the other one is fine. Yes, sir. Her voice dropped again. A passenger. I put the sign up, but some people... Never mind. Go on. Yes, sir. Here's what he wants. The money in an overnight bag, nothing smaller than fifties, nothing bigger than hundreds, banded in $25,000 bundles. He wants the plane to land at the end... He wants the plane to land at the end of runway 725 at Jacksonville, as far from the terminal as possible. Hold it, Captain Littlejohn said and spoke into the mic. Security, did you get on that? We got it. Go on. Go ahead, Clarice. Yes, sir. He doesn't want anyone to come near. He says the passengers can get off. After that, he will come out of the washroom. The money will be delivered, but no one can enter the plane. And he wants two parachutes. Two of them. That's what he said. A sports model and an army standard. Security could be heard speaking in an aside to someone. Get a fast check on Carl Wagner through the U.S. Parachute Association. Right away, you hear? It came back full. What else, Captain? Clarice? That's all, Captain. So far, he says instruction will be given when we're on the ground. Right. The intercom button was depressed and the captain spoke into his mic. Security will want to be cleared for landing on 725 regardless of wind direction. Roger. And what about the money he wants? It'll be there. I don't know how long he'll keep it, but he'll get it, as well as the parachutes. Good, Captain Littlejohn said. I'd hate to lose Millie, not to mention a plane full of passengers. There was no reply. The mic was switched off, attention given to flying the plane. The sunset was almost behind them now. The shadows of the Smokies creeped beneath their wings. The Knoxville Jackson beam was intercepted. The plane banked smoothly into the air corridor, its heading now nearly due south. The engines droned into the deepening darkness. The cockpit's light showed the strain on the faces of the men within. At last, the lights of Jacksonville could be seen, together with the feathery trail outlining the beach down toward St. Augustine. The plane began losing altitude. With a sigh, Captain Littlejohn turned over the plane to the co-pilot, who immediately began speaking with the tower. Captain Littlejohn took over the task of informing the passengers. He pressed the popper button. His voice was completely impersonal. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain again. Due to adverse weather conditions, we are forced to make our landing at the Jacksonville, Florida airport. A company representative on the ground will explain the delay and arrange any necessary transportation. We regret this inconvenience. Now please fasten your seatbelts, bring your seats to the vertical position, and observe the no smoking sign. The last grumbling passenger had filed from the plane. Surprised to find himself forced to take a waiting bus to the distant terminal building, Unaware that very shortly he and his fellows would be in the envious position of being able to tell their friends of their adventure. Gasoline trucks were completing their refueling operation. A small station wagon took the place of the departing bus, and two men got out. One brought a small parachute in one hand and an overnight bag in the other. The second man carried a more cumbersome parachute. They climbed the aluminum steps, placed their loads on the floor of the plane without entering, nodded to a pale Clarice, merely glanced in the direction of the washroom door, and made their departure. They looked like FBI, and were. From the cockpit window, Captain Little John watched them climb into their car and back off. He raised the microphone. Clarice? Yes, Captain. Where do we go from here? Just a second. There was a long pause. On the ground, the fuel lines were being sucked into the trucks like monsters consuming outside spaghetti. Clarice was back. Captain, he says first to head towards Miami. 
He wants you to maintain minimum flying speed. He says 200 knots will do, and stay at 2,000 feet altitude. He wants the rear passenger door left unlatched from the outside. Security in the tower had heard. It cut in. Captain, is it possible to jump from your plane? It is from this one, Little John said. He obviously selected a 727 on purpose. He couldn't do it in a 707 or a 747. Either he must know something about flying, or he studied up for this caper. For a quarter of a million dollars, security said dryly, I imagine a man would be willing to study, or even make his first parachute jump. There's no record of him in any skydiving group we've dug up so far. If it's his real name. As you say, if it's his real name. Any danger of depressurization at that altitude with the door being open? Not at 2,000 feet, and Florida's flat. And if we didn't leave the door unlatched, he could still always use one of the emergency doors. Captain Little John's voice was getting tight. The weight was making him nervous. Well, what do we do? There was a pause. A new voice came on. Captain, this is Major Willoughby of the Air Force. Do you have any suggestion? Well, Little John said slowly, I suppose we could keep over water. He wouldn't jump there. It might give you time to scramble a few planes and meet us somewhere. He won't stand still for that water bit very long, but if you have a few planes follow, it might help. The co-pilot cut in, a boy with much wartime experience. If he free falls even 500 feet, they'll never see him at night. At least they could try. I'll buy that, Major Willoughby said. I'll get you cleared for following the coast as long as you can. We'll get other aircraft out of the way, although you'll be flying far below anything commercial until you get near airports. Try to hold over water until Dayton if you can. We'll be with you by then at the latest, all right? Fine. Captain, Clarice said in a tight voice, he's getting nervous. Tell him we're on our way, Little John said, and he pressed the first of the engine starting button. The plane swung about, the engine wind built up, and then they seemed to leap free. The large plane raced down the runway, gathering speed, and then seemed to raise itself slightly. They swooped up vertically, the city lights fell away, twisting as they banked. Little John leveled off, followed the coast a mile offshore. Security came back on the radio. What's our boy doing now? God knows, Little John said. He'll undoubtedly be coming out of his little washroom soon, and he'll see we're over water. Then, he shrugged. The shrug was reflected in his voice. Well, then we'll see. Keep this radio link open. Don't worry. Captain. Yes, Clarice. He's going to come out. Little John spoke rapidly. Clarice, that microphone cord should reach to the next seat. I want you to strap yourself in, and I want Millie to strap herself in as soon as she comes out. That nut can jump or not, for all I care, but I don't want either of you girls to take any chances near that open door, do you hear? Yes, sir. Just a second. There was a short pause. I'm strapped in, Captain. The timbre of her voice changed. Captain, they're out. How's Millie? Pale as a ghost, and I don't wonder. Millie, sit down. Strap yourself in. A brief pause with everyone in the cockpit staring intently at the small cloth-covered speaker. Captain, he's looking down at the water. He says either you turn over land right now, or he'll kill Millie and then me. Captain, I think he means it. Turn, security said at once. It's all right anyway, Major Willoughby's voice said. We just picked you up. Little John instantly put the plane into a bank. The lights of Crescent Beach fled beneath them. A cluster with route A1A etched on either side. Captain. Yes, Clarice? He says, let me talk to him. Just a second. Silence. Captain, he won't talk into the microphone. But he says fly to Akala and then turn straight south for Naples. Same speed, same altitude as now. He says you can come out of the cockpit by Naples. He'll be gone by then. Security cut in. Do it his way, Captain. Don't take any chances. The Major's plane have you in sight, and we've also got every tower's police notified to be on the lookout for a shoot. He won't get far. There's a lot of empty space in Central Florida, but whatever you say, Little John said. In that case, why not get us cleared from Naples over to Miami at a reasonable altitude? and make us some hotel reservations there for the night. Will do. Clarice came back on, nervous. Captain, he wants a... Captain, he wants us to get up into the cockpit before he jumps. Doesn't want us to see. Little John sighed. All right, but hang on. I'll bank slightly to keep you away from that door. Come ahead. The men waited, impatiently. At last, there was a tap on the door. It opened, and two very nervous stewardesses climbed into the cramped space, shutting the door behind them. Millie was pale from her ordeal. Clarice was partially supporting her. Little John looked at them questioningly. She'll be all right, Clarice said. 
Little John set his jaw and stared down. Beneath their steady nose, Dade City came and went, and then the vastness of southwestern Florida, inching past at a maddeningly slow speed of 200 knots. At last, the lights of the west coast could be seen in the still night. The radio man looked up. Naples coming up, he said. They stared down, watching the lights pass them, and then they were over the gulf. Little John turned to the co-pilot. Mike, want to take a look? Be careful. Right, said the co-pilot. He pushed past the stewardesses and into the empty corridor of the plane. He walked to the other end of the plane and back, hanging onto the seats as he passed the cabin door, swinging back and forth, clanking as if struck each time. He came back into the cockpit and closed the door. All clear. We missed him, Major Willoughby's voice said, disappointed. We'll pick him up, don't worry. We've got the whole state covered under your route. Well, Captain, you're clear to Miami. Good night and good luck. Thanks, Little John said, and he switched off the microphone. His hands pressed the engine throttles forward. Well, children, he said, it's been a long day. Let's go get some rest. The maps from the map bag were piled to the one side. Captain Little John was reaching into the bag. 50,000 each, the captain said softly. Not bad for a few hours' work, plus a little careful planning, especially considering that it's tax-free. I ought to get more, Millie said suddenly. Five long damned hours crammed into a tiny washroom with a dead man. You? What about me? I had to push him out of that damned door. Even though I was fastened in with the harness and the rope, I was still scared silly I'd go out of the plane with him. I had to kill the poor bastard, the radio man said. The co-pilot was paying no attention to the complaints. He was neatly putting his share in his attaché case. Charles Wagner, he said to no one in particular. The hard luck guy who went to the John at the wrong time. I wonder what he did for a living.